them to have a, such a full house. I'm happy to see. And I'm happy for uh, to see our speaker. I don't want to talk uh, beat around the bush. Blackouts are not a nice thing. Everyone possibly saw one or experienced one. You don't want to have them. And how to actually cause one and how to prevent one, oh, well, that will be told by our next speaker, Matthias Dahlheimer. Day four, you're planning your trip home, so thank you for coming so in so many numbers. So this shows that this might be a significant topic for some of you, for most of you. So usually uh, a talk about blackouts starts with uh, about a book by Mark Ellsberg called Blackout. I like this book way better. This is the basis of this um, novel from the Office for... Uh, technical analysis, uh, it's a scientific analysis of what are mechanisms of blackouts, uh, large, large scale uh, power blackouts. So uh, after about five days, they say we would have like s a situation that is pretty warlike here in Germany. So there's a risk there. So <laughs> was it was it woohoo or I don't know, but the risk is pretty small, but the impact would be very large. All right, how, how, how uh, predictable is our power supply network? So there's uh, organizations in Europe that um, calculate the system average interruption duration index. It's uh, pretty hard to pronounce, but this is just a number that says within a year how many minutes was there no power available for a consumer. And if we have a look at this, that's around about 13 minutes. So that's for Germany 2008 to 2013. Plotted for, for this duration, duration renewable energies um, were, were like improving a lot. So about 30% of our energy comes from renewable energy sources. So you can see at these numbers, you can't prove, um, you can't, you can't prove like renewable energy energy sources uh, endanger the network. But let's stay at this Saidi number. How do we calculate that? So there's um, paragraph 52 uh, for the uh, producers. Whenever there's like more than three minutes, a blackout of more than three minutes. Um, then they have to tell someone, to tell it to the Bundesnetzagentur. They have a XML web service that uh, s receives that um, number and then saves it to a SQL database and then create a report and uh, calculate the SAID number. So, um, so I, I requested this database. It took about nine months using the Freedom of Information Act. Um, so it was kind of a painful experience for me because the Bundesnetz agency and me, we were like of different opinions, like who was able to access that content. So I thought, I thought I thought it should be freely available, but I only got a subset for now of these data. So, if we have a look at, at this, the first uh, blackout is from 2008. The last one is from the end of 2013. So, this is the basis for my data analysis. So, the reasons for blackouts are just added up here. So, one thing is they have a problem with UTF UTF-8 encoding, obviously. Uh, so there's the curious, <laughs> curious reason for a blackout called "Please choose." It's the last one on the list. Uh, let me let, let me phrase it this way: the input validation <laughs> maybe might have been improvable in this case. So, but let's get serious. The data is kind of uh, interesting. This is plotted. One point is a blackout. The y-axis is the 
power that has been missing times the duration. So how large was the blackout? X axis, axis is the time. And we can see like most, most stuff is happening on low um, network load layers, voltage layer. So this is, of course, this is, this is uh, the others have, have more redundancies and more fail safe. So this is like to be expected. So this, this looks possible, but I don't really trust this data because the reason for this is the following. This is kind of complex. On the x-axis, we have the time, and the y-axis, we have the accumulated number of uh, blackouts. So what I would expect is a line like the red one, so just like con continuously um, outages uh, like go, go, up, go up, go up over time. And the red one is actually the, the line for all the producers, but the black lines, I just selected ten random, randomly 10 uh, producers and added them up. And let's look at this, this value 641. That's a curve that looks pretty weird. 2008, this producer had like four outages. 2009, it was 29. 2010, it was 1900. 2011, 57, and so on. And what made me pause was this jump in 2010. That's actually a line exactly um, that, that actually changes changes inclination directly when the years are changing. So this is not something that would be explainable physically, more like organizationally. So the Bundesnetzagentur, we don't, we don't know how this, how they score these data, but I have some questions for this. So if someone from the agency is able to explain this to me, I would be very grateful. So the official statistics and the official monitoring, I think it's kind of curious. Uh, I don't, I don't want to say it's bullshit, but I have some questions. So how does it work? The how does the planning work, the, the reliability or the dependability in our generation network or in the distribution network? There are some criteria, and the, the most important criterion is the N minus 1 security. It says if, if I have N, N big devices and, and one fails, the rest has to work. And that's necessary because I need to do maintenance to uh, fix a, a high voltage line, uh, something like that. And with these... In this, uh, here we have three phases that are transmitted and two, two wires transmit one phase and the other wire can fail and the other one will still work if, if there um, are reserves. So, so, so let's take a step back. How does it work? Uh, the power generation system and this is from Wikipedia, and I really like to use that because it is quite complex, even if it's a, a very a very abstract level. Uh, what is there in a in a electricity network? There is the network itself or the grid in different voltage levels: uh, high voltage, uh, 220 and 380 kilovolts, um, then the high voltage and uh, medium voltage and lower voltage, and uh, it branches out into the um, households and what we get is low voltage and the highest voltage uh, one tries to reduce the losses on the, the line losses by the high voltage and the whole operation is is very strictly regulated and by the federal agency for a network for electricity gas telecommunications etc and you have uh, different generators on different levels of the network uh, with the big nuclear power stations and coal-fired power stations, uh, they are on the highest level, and there are medium, um, medium level power plants on the medium or high voltage level. There are wind, wind generation parks and uh, big photovoltaic or solar power stations. And what is new, and where the renewables really make problems in the grid, is if that is that you have generation units on the lowest level, on the low voltage level. But this is just a, a, a side remark. Um, I'm not going to get into details about that. And then you have the consumers. There are industrial consumers, even on higher network levels. 
and but mostly on the municipal networks on the lowest level and uh, and there is also generation on that level so when you have a full so if you want a slide for the workings of the power generation network and it, then it must be this slide the generated power must equal the consumed power there is practically no way to store uh, electricity in this in this um, on this scale if when i turn on my tv somewhere more power must be generated otherwise this wouldn't work and the network frequency the 50 hertz uh, they are the indicator for imbalance for power imbalance and you can think of it as like this scale if uh, generation and consumption um, then it's 50 hertz and everything is fine and if you have too much load uh, over the generation then my network frequency goes down on the other hand if you have if I have too much generation and too little load then the frequency goes up and that is the indicator which can be used for regulation um, how much power is required and you measure the network frequency and you know how many do I need to uh, fire more coal and when I started uh, started getting into this into the into this topic there were no freely available data um, many companies measure that and many service providers uh, measure that um, for um, electricity for the electricity market but freely available and high resolution there were no data available and I said okay I'll, I'm going to build this myself it's just a micro microcontroller it's a Raspberry Pi and can still be optimized but for more than a year and a half I have um, data records of uh, different devices and I had a talk about that, about this project, how that worked in the background. And uh, so, but for this talk, I only use the data that I've recorded from that project. So that was that about um, network grid, the power grid. And let's get back to the blackout. The scenario that we always um, hear in the press, the hacker attacks a nuclear power plant. Uh, is that something special? Is that a problem? Or what, what does the network do in that case? What, you can observe that. Here's a, here's a nuclear power plant. It's Grundremmingen. And on the 25th of, 25th of March, there was a, um, a, a SCRAM uh, emergency shutdown. There are three reactor blocks. The first is, uh, is down, and the second was not, not operated. The third was operating. and. The maintenance caused, uh, caused an outage of the pressurized air supply, and there was, a, was an emergency um, shutdown, uh, a trip of this uh, nuclear power, power plant. And how much um, was the, how much power was lost at that pound, and how much power did it put out? And on a nuclear power plant, there, you, you look at the available cooling power, and can I get rid of my excess heat? That's one of the important factors in a nuclear power plant. And uh, I looked around with weather data and I uh, asked, and uh, okay, they said it was uh, at maximum performance, maximum power, it was 1.3 gigawatts at the time of the outage. And this is the frequency. And you can see on the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the frequency. And you can see uh, in the beginning it was uh, very close to 50 hertz, as it should be, as it is normally. And then during, in a very short time, uh, this is 19 seconds, there's a very quick drop down to the frequency. It's about 50 millihertz. And after that, the network uh, regulates that again and uh, if the outage of a single power plant is is more or less noise and there are events that are much bigger and this is not a big problem um, and we can look what uh, forces are at work here and i used this frequency measurement and smoothed it a bit and on the smooth data the blue line is the smooth data and uh, made the first uh, differential on of that and third derivative and uh, the gradients the power gradients were quite a big it was five gigawatts per minute uh, peak peak change and these are huge mechanical 
stress on the on the power plant and the the operator of this power power plant wasn't happy when uh, when an intern or someone uh, played around with the pressurized air and how does this stabilization work how could the grid do that and there are three effects and uh, i roughly sketch those three effects and in the following i always talk about the UTCE um, reference case. They, they start with a relatively low network load of 150 gigawatts and assume the outage of a, two, of a double block, uh, three gigawatts, maybe a nuclear power station or a bit more completely goes down. And there are three effects which work cumulatively. And you always have to imagine those three curves being added First is the blau, that is the use of rotational energy, and the red one is the rotational energy plus network self-regulation regulatory effect, and the black is the primary regulation that is an actively regulated component, and the other two are just physical effects. To rotational energy, this is the turbine or an X-turbine of Block 2 Felixburg. This has a mass of about 190 tons and rotates at 25 rotations per second. There's a huge generator axis on that and a generator shaft, and this is one device in this power plant. In this rotational motion, there's a lot of energy stored in that. And this is the momentary reserve. And what it does is the blue line, and this says, how fast the frequency um, degrades and this turbine rotates with a multiple of the frequency of the network grid all synchronized across Europe and if some, something goes down then all masses um, are braked and decelerated more or less um, in unison and this momentary reserve is the inertia of all generators but also on the consumer side are some inertial masses. There are some masses such as pumps or compressors. They also contribute to that. Where I have a rotational machine, they all contribute to that. And now we look on the addition of all three effects. Um, how does that combine? If you use this, if, you, if I change this rotational energy, um, and it is characterized by Nets Anlaufzeit, and if, uh, if that is sm small, I have a sh steep decline of the initial frequency, and um, if it is higher, then I get the more smooth uh, black one. And these are empirical estimates, but it's about in the right range in Europe. So the red curve is the network self-regulatory effect. And I have 1.5 to 2 percent reduction of percent for every percent of uh, reduction in frequency. And uh, if you imagine about an asynchronous motor, and if I if I uh, and it uses less energy if I reduce the rotational speed, except it is really um, there's a frequency transformer. Then it's not. No longer true, but everything that is really synchronous um, contributes to this effect. This is the same plot, the same graph. This is the network coefficient. The red line is the initial. Then there's the initial dip higher, and if it's uh, the coefficient is high, then the initial dip is small. And now we get to the first active component. So far, it was only physical effects that are just part of the European network, and now we are in the regulatory system in a huge power plant, for example, a nuclear power plant, and there is a mechanism called primary regulation, and uh, because if there is a frequency dip, and we are trying to stabilize that. And uh, there's a circuit of, from a circuit diagram from a paper that I can recommend from, from um, Elgard. 
And I recommend that if you want to know more about it. This was my source. And what I did at one, there's a frequency sensor, and I look what is the actual network frequency and uh, transmit that to uh, two. There is a regulatory system, and there is the the speed of the generator and compare the two the frequency and see how that works together and what is my set point and what is my current value and in the end uh, we open or close a valve and more or less steam is admitted to the generator and that way you can um, can you know, correct that or by the inertia of the rotational turbines and there is a certain time it takes around 30 seconds delay um, you have in, the, in this system until the primary regulation really works. From the regulatory strategy, it's a simple proportional regulator a feedback control loop. This is from the European Commission, um, how this uh, should be structured. And in, in principle, if you have a positive frequency deviation, then the power is reduced, and if you have a negative frequency deviation, then you increase the power. It's uh, quite simple. And the, uh, the slope of this, of this uh, graph is, uh, is determined for each uh, power plant or each uh, energy company. Okay. All right, so back to Gondremingen. I wrote a model that I wanted to sh that I showed to you right now that uh, creates those plots um, about the regulatory behavior of these things. There's no there's one uh, important thing uh, that we need to actually run this, and that's the network load. So how much energy was produced in the re e European Union or was actually consumed in the European Union? So on the x-axis, we have uh, the time of the day. So UT those are UTC hours. And this, uh, the others is the network load in megawatts. And this uh, curve just moves around in the, the, for different, um, like in the summer, we need less light than in the winter and so on. And also, it depends on the time of the day. So what we, if we roughly look at the so 20, 25th of March, uh, 7.35 when this um, was about 405 gigawatts and of consumed energy. Yeah. Okay. So this is my measured data uh, laid over the model. The green line is the actually measured network frequency and the other lines you already know. If you look at the black line at the top, the hockey form stick there, that's pretty well balanced on one uh, le level, like uh, almost before the outage. So, if I compare my measurements with, uh, like, I, I can actually predict my measurements with this um, with this model. What I can't predict is the actual f f uh, shape of the um, the measurements, because there's other things happen in Europe uh, other than this event. So it's impossible to actually predict this curve exactly. But like um, roughly speaking, this is pretty well fitting. The model isn't really calibrated well, but I, <laughs> I, I would need I would need more more uh, like atomic power plants to to quickly shut down to trip their to trip their reactors to actually calibrate this. <laughs> but. Um, the reason for to, for this work is to have to to cal calculate measurement data. What happens when atomic power plants uh, have outages, and then how can I improve this model in the future? So just to, so we have a measurement, like how how big is uh, how, how how big is the delay to um, how big is the delay to reestablish our stability in the network? How large are these? How large uh, uh, a delay can we actually survive? So. What happens if uh, consumers uh, have disturbances, producers, sorry. So physical effects stabilize the network in the first 10 seconds. So without the physical effects, this would not work because we don't have a regulation that happens that fast. Then after that, the primary regulation takes effect. So if I wanted to cause a blackout, I, want to, I would have to Get a, create a huge jump in the network frequency. So, 
the primary regulation like would take in like take uh, take effect to last. The same happens for uh, consumer outages. So, for example, if I go in a like uh, industries or private homes, whatever. Uh, whatever consumes power, whenever I just disconnect that from power, then the frequency goes up, but basically it's the same effect. Good. Good. So. <coughs> Next, point. Next point here is, uh, what about the power lines? Yeah. Um. Oh, the transmission network. So the transmission network can have outages as well. For example, uh, November 4th, 2006, about 10 past 10 p.m., the Norwegian Pearl, this very pretty ship, was actually um, finished by the worth in, like, uh, was finished in Partenburg. They don't have a direct access to the North Sea, so they have to transport those ships to the North Sea somehow. Uh, this is this is made more complicated by the fact that there's a high voltage line, power line. This is a picture. There, there was there was these uh, red and white the, these red and white uh, pylons were, weren't there back then because it was uh, lower down. So the ship was actually too high. So the um, shipyard actually called the power energy uh, company and told them, told them could we actually disable those power lines. Yes, Ian did that. You can see the red line there. This is round about where the line goes. Uh, there's the Ems, uh, goes into the North Sea, and they talked about it, and they, Eon just switched off this line. And there was a small fuck up there. Eon had on his side, oh, they planned to, to distribute the electrical power over other high voltage lines. Um, And on Eon's side of one of those lines, there was a. They assumed that the trip value for um, a circuit breaker was 3,000 amperes, and on the other side, on uh, RVE, was the same um, circuit breaker with 2,100 amperes. And Eon made a calculation and said, "Oh well, okay, we are at 2,500 amperes, and it's maybe well, it's just a, an imagined value, two five or something, but uh, it's below our our trip value, so um, it'll be safe." And of course, this uh, line tripped, and because the situation in the grid just transferred a lot of power, there was a chain reaction and an outage cascade, and every number in this slide is the trip of one high voltage line. This was uh, across the Republic, across the country, and the consequence was that, that the European grid separated into three areas with different frequencies. And here you can say areas such as Spain, France um, had an under frequency, Hamburg had over frequency, and uh, in, the, in an easterly direction and in the southeasterly direction was under frequency again, and ungood really. So, and there were three network frequencies in the graph in in the plot, and that wasn't quite as good. And one tr they tried to fix it. The blackout was around. Uh, 10 past 10 in the evening and around 22.34, so 25 minutes later, they tried to reconnect two areas and it didn't really work and it really took nine attempts to physically reconnect the network networks. And they ha discovered quite a lot of effects of frequency oscillations. The frequency went up and the wind turbines in the north um, uh, had a different frequency and um, turned off and the frequency went down again and the, and the wind turbines found the frequency to be fine and connected again. And well, it's, not a, it's a non-trivial system and it's a highly complex system and there's a lot of 
a lot of laws and regulations and we are talking about Europe and in Italy there are quite different uh, threshold values. And to make another, another abstraction here and uh, make it better understandable, I thought about another scenario. This is a little Python script uh, which uh, implements, simulates the IEEE 24 reliability test system. So there are um, power flows in the American um, high voltage network, no idea what it's actually called there. But you have to imagine behind every one of these little green circuits there's a network segment, there's a lot of, there's a lot that's behind that. Um, and in a normal operation, uh, for example, between 6 and 10 the line um, has overcapacity and is operated over capacity that happens sometimes and it's just a uh, small overcapacity it could also be more and uh, so I shut down the line between 16 and 14 16 uh, 14 is uh, still still supplied and this is the n minus 1 security and it continues working and if I now uh, shut on the line between 11 and 14. 14 is isolated, but there are further effects. The line between 11 and 13 doesn't uh, transmit any energy at all anymore. And why or how and where which power plant is and how it was supplied before, the, you can't see that in this, in this example, but it, there are non-intuitive connections. And now I trip the line between 3 and 9, and now a lot of stuff happens. Now I have between 8 and 7 an outage. There's a, it's sort of in a completely different place. And now, place. And now between 16 and 19, there's a line which uh, slowly heats up. And between 1 and 3, there's a line which is operated at 250% of nominal capacity. And so we assume that will soon go down as well. And now we have the case, well, it's just, just an example to make it more understandable. And now we have the case that one has two working lines but cannot be, cannot be supplied because of physical effects, of the underlying physical effects. Um, and the conclusion for the grid is um, electricity networks are extremely complex and every Every event, every action, for every switching action will be checked um, and for the consequences on the net. And usually that works, everything goes fine. And such a cruise ship is not delivered every day. So, but inherently these nets uh, are, are prone to cascade outages or cascade effects. And if something goes wrong, more can go wrong. And the um, behavior of this network is not intuitive, so you can't look at the network plan and make an X and you can understand everything that goes on, but, but you really have to make a complex simulation. Okay. All right, this is exacerbated by the increasing transport of energy. There's a liberated European energy market. Uh, energy is actually being brokeraged at the... At the so uh, uh, French people can actually buy Austrian energy and this let them send the energy across the networks. But the networks actually have to transport this energy. So uh, platform uh, this is from the uh, network transparency platform of the European power producers. This is just a random screenshot. The data is online. You can have you can have a look at them. And this is a situation where. Um, the energy is being distributed through the uh, through the through Transnet DE uh, from France to uh, the, the Switzerland and Austria, so just business as usual. This, just uh, so this is completely uh, irrelevant. What else is happening in the network of Transnet? So there's a brokerage of energy. So the possibility is also to to move around these, this energy and this is an, an, an additional exacerbation of the networks. So when we look at the energy brokerage. So this is an event that's just random from my data set. This is not something very important or something very um, like that springs into the eye. This is just a situation from September 2014, shortly after midnight. The frequency dips rapidly. 
was uh, from like the very top to the very bottom were about 160 or 170 millihertz. So about three <laughs> atomic power plants worth that just break away. This is something that's pr very normal. It's a, a brokerage artifact that doesn't have a physical reason behind it. Nothing uh, broke down, but it's a consequence of energy brokerage. So I found lots of these events and just uh, calculated a median network uh, frequency across the times of the day. So I took my data and just like calculated a median frequency and plotted that and this is the graph that comes out there. So what I was expect is that it would just result in about 50 hertz but as you can see the middle the network frequency has structures, very visible structures. And so if we have a look, a closer look at this so this is uh, zoomed in so then we'll find every hour there's an event so in the evening I have to go back sorry they go down in the evening and in the morning they go up mid in the midday there's uh, less events but like in the morning and afternoon and uh, the morning and evening this the events are larger so this is a the reason behind this is this uh, energy is brokeraged in hours or quarter hours and uh, you see single products in this market being traded and the next uh, the next power plant like taking over the the power production for this so so this is my recipe for a blackout you need a a jump in energy in produce and this has to be quicker than the frequency regulation so the primary regulation can't take effect and I have to find a constellation where maybe I can find an outage cas cascade in the power network that like exacerbate this even more so what I wanted what to dis I want to disturb the equilibrium be between creation and consumption so concretely what if I wanted to do something I would find a day with lots of wind because uh, wind power plants are not part of the primary regulation so this means that if, if I have a wind uh, a power plant I have less um, rotating mass in the other uh, power plants and this is bad then I want to find a per, uh, position with the trading data where lots of, lots of energy is exported in different networks for example from France to Great Britain which which are part of the power network and I would try to find a change change between hours, like a, a time of the day where there's lots of irregularity anyway, and then I just need to quick jump in network energy. So this is my plan of attack. So shortly before Christmas, hacker infiltrated parts of the US power grid. Okay, obviously, if it was hackers or uh, governments or some non-transparent organizations, whoever that is, it's a software system, so it is being attacked somehow. So, additionally, the software systems uh, in the power um, grid production, it's a monoculture, so of, of 800 uh, producers, 300 of them use the IDS High Light system, which is a play on words in German. So, if I am in the High Light product and I find a, a, a sh an attack point, I can, uh, I can also attack the other 299 systems. So, that's a monoculture. Smart meter is also a um, yeah, with the German smart meters, you cannot just uh, um, turn off the entire house, but you can control individual devices in the household. But it's uh, maybe easier in the other in the other countries. They have uh, smart meters which are protected even less, and you just don't attack the smart meters, but the control center of the smart meters and everything that is green. Um, there is a smart meter infrastructure which allow. Uh, allow the household to be cut off from the network uh, remotely.
So potentially, without without having looked at the systems in detail, um, not not in, in any detail, but this is a computer system, and there's the possibility to switch uh, to switch rates and tariffs, and and maybe you can. Uh, predefine times at which those change and uh, maybe you can find some scripts and uh, and influence that and maybe this that's a good point in time and maybe you shut down half of France but it's uh, it's even simpler and I, I want to talk about a short-term jump in power in the network and I can just manipulate part of the network I have power lines which transport this kind of power and they are somewhere in the forest and I'm just looking for a nice place and destroy mechanically the infrastructure and if I do it good and if I, I just destroy that part of the infrastructure that is the most critical and that is just the homework that I'm not going to do but there is there are military weapons for that they're called graphite bombs they have graphite uh, powder or carbon fibers and they are they are fired upon uh, high, high voltage lines or power stations and create a short circuit they were used in the second gulf war they were used in kosovo and it's really well it's a mature technology that is available and yeah Okay, what is my criticism here? In the beginning I said uh, there's this N minus one criterion and one part uh, goes down and the rest has to continue working. But what happens around that? What does the energy grid do and where are the weak points? And this uh, systemic weakness are not um, are not taken into account for that. We have the power brokering, we have um, a high load on the network and this creates power jumps and uh, I know that beforehand and the power jumps, the cascade effects are not really looked at in, 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 uh, in the current research and these cascade effects have not been uh, explicitly looked at and there are further effects uh, but I don't have measured Data, measured data for that, but there are frequency oscillations, and the frequency uh, frequency oscillates between Portugal and and Turkey. Maybe there's a there's an oscillation of the network frequency, and if that is really stable, I don't know. There are some there are some records uh, in the grid operators, but I haven't found. I don't have any any measuring points outside of Germany, but if you want to do that, um, just uh, contact me and I'd be very grateful. But uh, what can we do? Uh, dare to allow more decentralization. There are uh, studies, a study at the, from the VDE, um, and how do we integrate renewable energies into our power distribution system, not only electricity, but also um, heat and, but, the suggestion is to have autonomous decentralized centers which cells which uh, um, exchange power but are autonomous so we don't have one huge system across Europe but small scale structures. What else do we need? Uh, we need stabilization on the low voltage level but uh, the system hasn't been built, built like that but we create the energy at the high level and uh, distribute it to the lower level but right now we also generate at the lower level and send it upwards and uh, so there's no primary regulation in a photovoltaic rectifier so um, and we have to do things there but there are efforts um, to get active there and to create new regulation and I'd, I'd really like to have autonomous cells in the power grid. A city such as Kaiserslautern uh, with the surroundings could um, could supply its own power and maybe it can exchange power with the neighboring cell. But if there's fine weather and everything works, then, then that thing can really work autonomously. Okay, that's really the end of it. And I'd really like to thank those people who send emails to me, 
before this talk and I heard that my thoughts aren't that wrong in principle, but there are lots of people who um, who talk about this and think about this topic. And if you want to look at the data, if you want to know more about the pro project, this is called NetZenus. And uh, thank you very much. So the URL is net, netzin.us, N-E-T-Z-S-I-N.us. Thank you very much. Ihr dürft Matthias jetzt Sachen fragen. Wer Matthias keine Sachen fragen will, sondern rausgehen will, möge das bitte leise tun und dabei möglichst wenig Mateflaschen umtreten. <lacht> also nochmal einen ganz herzlichen Dank. Und äh, ja. So our eighth bottle just kept popping over. So questions, please. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. I have a question about autonomous small networks. Uh, if you want to, to buy uh, electricity, you need to um, synchronize the frequency, so you need big rectifiers. All right, so with your new renewable energy, you have this anyway, because this happens with these devices anyway. Uh, but I don't know where, you've, where your question goes to. So how, how can that be done? Is that possible today? Um, so feasible, possible. We are um, recreating our uh, energy system anyway right now. Um, it's technically possible, but we're, we're doing a lot to integrate photovoltaic power plants anyway right now, so the additional effort isn't that much. So the biggest obstacle is probably that the people who have a finished power network, they don't want this to change. And there's very large lobbies uh, working to to push this in the, in the, into the opposite direction. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it would be great, uh, great sign of respect um, towards those who are interested to leave the room quietly. From the internet, please. Okay, the internet would like to know if with distributed and synchronized measurements uh, of the network frequency to find out where or which power plant has gone down, well, speed of light isn't infinite. Cool question, especially because uh, in the transformator, uh, like collections of transformators, they actually also influence the timing and delays. So it's a nice thought, but possibly we would have to have a very detailed map uh, where the lines are, where the transformators are, how the lines are being used, and so on. The data is freely available, though. So if someone knows how, then uh, to do it. Go, uh, send me an email. What would it be like if we, if we um, attack the metal melting plants uh, of the industry so that suddenly there's a lot less consumption. This is basically the same, just like the energy goes down. So the, if I have like a loss of energy being produced or a loss of energy being confused, the curve, go, curve goes uh, down. So this is basically the same. The, the only difference is that uh, these uh, 50.2 hertz problem where uh, wind power plants uh, just shut down, this changes though. I'm not sure if it's like already being done or if it's like in the future, but this um, very fixed uh, point where they shut off, they want to actually remove that from the infrastructure. It means so just turning off uh, if consumption goes down is, is no longer the thing. So with wind power plants, they will just reduce their power output and with photovoltaic uh, plants, it's the same already. So it's not, a, it's not a fixed point, but it's a gradient. The gradial reduction. Okay, I'm a okay over there. Uh, roughly, how much deviation in percent do you need to have a complete blackout of the grid, and how long would it take then to um, start the network again to get it going again? All right, give me a second, please. All right. This is just the frequencies where something happens in the energy grid. It's a lot of text, but more or less, if I'm below 49.5 or above 
50.50 hertz, then things happen. So uh, segments are thrown off, or and so so a blackout is being produced to stabilize the frequency, or um, power plants are actually being shut down. So this actually is in place already. But this means the the system would protect itself from a total European blackout. So and it would just kick out Hamburg from the from the uh, network. Well, Ham Hamburg but would just be noise. But but for example, you go to um, steel melting facilities and just steal their energy. There's like special contracts that allow this, the, like to to just like close off their energy for a short time. So this means that we, we would have to trip this very quickly to actually but like so, this. So, sorry. Um, if you have a law, big load shedding, then what do you do against that, If against this over frequency? Because it takes a while when you shut it down after, until the inertia is gone. Is there a huge, um, huge um, consumer? Do you, do you turn on a huge light bulb or something? So I know actually energy companies that have water cookers that are as large as one megawatts to take part in the energy brokerage. So uh, I'm actually, I'm actually like, like they think like I'm actually, I'm actually gaining money if I use up energy. So I'm actually activating the water cooker. But what they think is they would usually reduce the output of a power plant. This is actually happening in inside the power plants by the primary regulation already. So the frequency actually regulates this. Okay. For the 50.2 hertz problem, problems, uh, as far as I know, this has already been been done. And but all the all the inverters had had to be changed. But by wind turbines, uh, it will is also implemented. And there are these nice linear curves and the regulation regulatory power with and wind turbines. I just read at Empion is also being implemented. So everything of, like that is is coming now. And th this wasn't a question. Just just an uh, some more information. Is it known if it's possible to to get uh, to the exchange the phases uh, to permutate the phases at the switching mean, stations? What do you mean funny? What do you mean permutate? I, I thought about uh, if that was possible to uh, with the existing switches to to uh, switch the phases there in the wrong way. Well. I don't want this to exclude this. Like, with a, if you just like throw in a spanner into the system, that would actually like forge itself then into the system. But this would be very a small and very local effect, so not in this uh, size. From, from the internet, please. Okay, the internet would like to know if you have data about the so-called Earth hours, where people say between today and uh, between seven and eight, everyone. Turns the light off. I have. I have data, but it's on the website. But I haven't actually looked at it. I just looked if uh, the event detector that I um, that I'm actually like running, uh, if that if there's something happens during the Earth hour, and there was no impact that I could measure or discern. But take the data, have a look yourself. Don't trust me. Okay, in Austria, there's diesel and and petrol, um, they create much more power than over the electricity grid. And if you try in the next uh, few years, maybe 20% of the uh, cars to convert them from uh, combustion to electric, then I wonder what happens to the electric grid. Do you have models or thoughts about that? Or what would happen, for example, if, if a controlled car is suddenly uh, switches from charging to discharging or vice versa? Right. So there's a lot of people who are thinking about exactly this topic, and I'm not that deep into it. But the nice thing about a battery is that uh, it can actually, in a very short duration, it can like shed a lot of load or receive a lot of load. So if I am able to like, uh, in a large scale, manipulate in an energy uh, like uh, mobile um, cars, I can actually create such an energy fluctuation as well. So there's no difference for me if I attacked smart meter or electric cars. Over here, please. I have another and a question about the EFG uh, information, freedom of information uh, request to the federal government. Can, can we find the data? 
All right, so I haven't yeah. uploaded the data, but it will be on my GitHub thing, which is linked on by the website. And uh, like the letters exchange isn't finished, finalized yet. It's on fragdenstaat.de, though, documented. But not right now, but give me a two to three days and then this will be the case. Okay, you said five days until civil war. And how many candles and ravioli and mate did you stockpile? Nothing at all. Candles, ravioli, and so on doesn't really. There's not enough because my heating doesn't work. If I don't have any gas, I can't can't uh, continue getting. I can't can't go to the ATM. ATM at the regular bank, they wouldn't give me anything. So my catastrophe prevention is pretty bad. But it's also bad for others here as well. So the internet, please, as long as still as it's still there. Okay, the internet would like to know how well this net network freak, network voltage um, changes can be used as a fingerprint, or for example, uh, find it out from the hum in the audio signal. Um, all right, so there's two things in my head right now. All right, so can I uh, take take the hum of audio and then like recreate like the idea like um, when was this and by by matching like this to the background hum of the network and I think it's pretty as feasible. But you we did well high resolution measurement data and the other thing that's going through the media every time is like. If, to, if I distinguish like the light and dark um, pattern in like TV shows, uh, then when was this actually to determine when was this actually being watched? Um, I try to have a look at this. I can't really um, understand it. Yeah, I would like to know how the synchronization of the generators works between the different power plants. <laughs> Sorry. Uh Sorry, you gotta, you gotta just like stop me. Yeah, but it's interesting. All right, so on the left side you see the just a, 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 an image of like the the power network and the round things are generators, and you can just imagine this the the L I the L one line. They are just like coupled through the L one line, and so my network sinoid. It's just like oscillates over the network, and so the generators just synchronize over the network sinoid. And if they wouldn't do that, mechanically there would be lots of stress. I have because I have the electrical force that's like being uh, generated by the generator from the from physical force. So if one generates more than the other, then it actually drags the other. So this is actually like um, you can imagine like two locomotives that are being coupled with feathers. Um, that's how, I like how you um, can imagine this. There's no, it's just the network frequency that does uh, this. My second question of before, uh, assume we have a, a network that is not operating, how long does it take to get into mm -hmm. operation? For Europe, no one knows this. Good question though. The black state scenarios, there's a special sequence how to like restart the network this probably works over uh, special kinds of power plants. So with the pumped storage, that works. Thank and you. Uh, and that's like how you uh, like you try to like recreate the the uh, landscape of producers, if this actually works, and how it works and how electric cars behave. No idea. Uh, we have to accelerate this for a few more questions. Uh, analogous to uh, network topology on, on the other side, we have these hierarchical networks and on the other side we have mesh networks and you prefer decentralization for the future and uh, looking at, so if we have meteorological extremes uh, between Greenland and Iceland and so this argument of decentralization, do they really take it seriously? So in my uh, experience, it's uh, that the electricity companies are very, very slow to react to input from the outside, regardless of where it comes from or why, or, or of the reason it comes. So I can't say that they uh, that they're like more slow to respond for this exactly exact topic. 
but I think they just want to save their um, their, their status quo and, and without like thinking about this problem exactly. Okay, as to the story about the market, the brokering, and that's what the power companies do, and you could regulate that in advance and you know in advance that something is coming are there systems for that and would that be possible financially okay so lots of stuff was happening with those uh, brokerage effects they were way larger a few years ago there's actually a group of people around professor fonda in stuttgart so and they to do something but there's a big misunderstanding the, the power companies are not the ones who actually do the power worker brokerage, but people who actually broke brokerage and trade uh, is actually like power plants with your energy supply company. So people who actually like um, ha like own the network actually can't take influence on this. This is actually being regulated by the EU. This uh, distinction between the roles. So there's no exchange here. Okay, two more quickly. And uh, maybe you can talk to him afterwards. Okay, short question. If someone in this project wants to participate in this project, how can I find the information and what does it cost? Uh, I'd love to. Go to the website. There's a, a tab, the project, and there's a list of things where I need help. Right now, the thing it's it costs because it's um, a Raspberry Pi. It's a kind of expensive, but I think we could like reduce the cost. It's just right now it just works, and it just like click it together. But I could also use people have who have like idea of data analysis and uh, who know a lot about like electrical energy, then about measurement stations. People, uh, people who create hard and software for this. This is all on the website, so it's all all on GitHub as well. Okay. Last question. Uh, as a follow-up, if I have a dense sensor network, you could uh, uh, measure the, the length of the line. I have no clue if this is electrically possible in detail, but I love the thought, though, because it's very nice. Actually, it came to me as well, so let's try this. All right.